Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Rachel Rubin, urologist and sexual medicine specialist in the Washington, D.C. area. I am so blessed to have one of my favorite sexual medicine doctors on earth, Dr. Mo Cara, who uh, comes to us from Baylor, and he's going to uh, tell you all about himself. He's the president of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America and has been a part of a very big trial that the results just came out all about testosterone, which is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start off. Um, Dr. Kara, please introduce yourself. And then um, we're going to talk all about the Traverse trial. So first of all, thank you, Rachel, for having me on. I am a professor of urology at Baylor College of Medicine and uh, really glad to be here. So tell us, we have some big news. The New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, we're talking all about testosterone. Tell us about all of these very exciting findings that have just come out. So Rachel, this is probably the most exciting time for testosterone. We will have the largest randomized placebo-controlled trial ever published on testosterone and cardiovascular and prostate safety. Um, landmark trial, uh, the genesis of this trial really started from cardiovascular concerns. So I have to put this in the context of a story. So before 2010, all the studies that you look at suggesting that testosterone may be protective against cardiovascular disease, no increased risk in cardiovascular events. 2010 to 2014, you remember there were four studies that came out suggesting that there may be an increased risk of cardiovascular events. Now, there are a lot of limitations with these studies, uh, not randomized, not placebo controlled. Uh, so, But in either case, in September of 2014, the FDA said, We'd like to further investigate this. And they convened. And two big things came out of that meeting in 2014. One, in 2015, they made a label change. And in the label of all testosterone products, it says long-term clinical safety of testosterone cannot be assessed and we need larger trials. It's inconclusive whether testosterone is safe against cardiovascular disease. But the second big thing that came out of that was the FDA required that manufacturers of testosterone product products conduct a large clinical trial to show that testosterone is safe. And that's where the Traverse trial started, 2015. This study was over 5,200 men randomized, placebo-controlled, to get testosterone gel or placebo, yet had low testosterone less than 300, uh, had to be symptomatic. But the key point was that all of these men either had pre-existing cardiovascular disease or they had cardiovascular risk factors. So they were already at high risk. Uh, and they had to have at least three out of eight cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. So this study started in May of 2018. We finished it in February of 2022. Um, and very excited today to share you the results of the four trials that have already been published. Let's hear it. So let's start with the first, the big one, the New England okay. Medicine one. Let's talk about the big one. So the big one is the New England Journal Cardiovascular Risk. Primary endpoint was time to cardiovascular events, meaning MI or stroke. Uh, secondary outcome was risk for high-grade prostate cancer. Tertiary outcome was any prostate cancer or uh, in intervention or medical or surgical for BPH and LUTs. So remember, all the patients got an IPSS score to look for their urinary symptoms, right? So, uh, but the benefit of this study was that there were also five other secondary outcomes sexual function, anemia, diabetes, uh, bone fracture, uh, and many of these studies are yet to come out. But the take-home message is this. Those men that received testosterone, their testosterone went up by about 148 nanogram per deciliter to roughly about 400 nanogram per deciliter. And the second uh, placebo group went up by about 14 nanogram per deciliter. It's just a small increase. But the key message is no increased risk in cardiovascular events, death from MI or stroke take-home message. But there were three things that surprised me. One, there was a slight increase in pulmonary embolism, 0.5% versus 0.9% in those men treated with testosterone. Secondary, there was, there was an increased risk in atrial fibrillation, 2.5% versus 3.5% in those taking testosterone. And the third, there was an increased risk in AKI, and 1.5% versus 2.3%. Now, remember, only the pulmonary embolism was adjudicated. The others weren't, so it was just self-reported. But in either case, it is what it is. There was a slight increased risk in pulmonary embolism, right? So uh, I think the take-home message for providers is, yes, there's no increased risk in cardiovascular events, uh, meaning stroke or MI, but a slight increased risk in pulmonary embolism, AKI, and AFib. So that's the cardiovascular study. The second study was the uh, sexual function study. 
1,000 patients in this subset uh, randomized to testosterone gel or placebo. Primary outcome was increase in sexual activity. Secondary outcome was increase in erectile function or libido. What did they find? Testosterone as monotherapy did not improve erectile function. And we know that. That's in the AUA guidelines. Testosterone as monotherapy does not improve erectile function. But it did significantly improve sexual activity and libido. And what was very nice about the study was it improved libido. That in improved improvement was sustained even up to 24 months. So again, big win for libido, but it does not improve erectile function as monotherapy. Then if you look at the prostate cancer trial, this came out last week. Uh, and this is looking at 5,200 men randomized to testosterone or placebo. Primary outcome was uh, uh, this study was looking at high-grade prostate cancer. Secondary outcome was do their urinary symptoms get worse, meaning IPSS, or do they need surgery like a TERP or a medication? So what did they find? No increased risk in high-grade prostate cancer. No increased risk in any type of prostate cancer. In fact, in the study, there were only 23 cancers out of 5,200 men. 11 were in the placebo, 12 were in the TRT group. So no significant difference whatsoever. And for the first time, a large study showing no increased risk of worsening of urinary symptoms. So you know it's on the package insert. Be careful if you give someone testosterone because their urinary symptoms may get worse. This study suggests not at all. There was no increased risk in surgical intervention, medical intervention, and no worsening on IPSS scores out of the 5,200 men. The last study, a little bit of a smaller study, was the anemia study looking at 815 patients. Uh, and the primary outcome was, if you look at men who have anemia, will this improve the anemia if you give them testosterone supplementation? And uh, the 815 patients, what they found at six months, yes, there was a significant improvement. It was 41% in those patients that received testosterone versus 27% in the placebo arm. This is not a novel study. It's been shown in the T-trials as well that if you give testosterone, it can cause erythrocytosis. But in this case, we're actually using it as a beneficial effect. We're trying to help those who have anemia uh, defined as a hemoglobin less than 12.7. So again, uh, these are the results of the four studies that have come out. We still have three more studies coming out, uh, bone fracture, diabetes, depression. So I'm excited about those. But again, very exciting times for testosterone research. Well, there you have it, folks. You've heard huge news. This is really groundbreaking research in testosterone therapy. And we really want to get the word out to the everyday primary care doctor who is seeing these patients come in all the time with symptoms. So, Dr. Kara, I'd love to ask you a few more questions about the, the Traverse trial. Please. What do you think primary care doctors should take away from this data? So I think they should first realize that testosterone does not increase the risk of heart attack or stroke. There was many clinicians in 2015 that stopped prescribing testosterone once the label changed. And if you asked them, they said, I'm concerned that testosterone may cause a heart attack in my patient. Now we know that is not true. We also know that many clinicians are scared that if I give testosterone, it may cause prostate cancer in this patient. And now with this large clinical trial, there's no data to suggest that testosterone increases the risk of prostate cancer. And this is very consistent with the AUA guidelines in 2018 that came out suggesting there's no increased risk of prostate cancer in men receiving testosterone. This study only confirms it. I think another important point is that testosterone is not the best treatment for ED as monotherapy. Uh, we do know that it does help if you're using a PD-5 inhibitor and use testosterone in conjunction. But we do know that testosterone may help with libido. So in those men who have low libido, using testosterone as monotherapy may be beneficial. And we do know that finally, testosterone does increase the risk of erythrocytosis. Uh, and in some patients, particularly those who have anemia, this may be beneficial. And that's what we saw in the Traverse trial as well. And so you, you alluded to this, but I think, you know, as primary care doctors, we're always talking about the risks versus the benefits. So in your practice, you have a very high volume sexual medicine practice. What do you see, and you've been doing this a lot of years now, what do you see as the benefits of testosterone therapy? And what are your patients telling you? Great question. So Rachel, the key is that, you know, patients who do not have a low testosterone value do not benefit. So they have to have a low serum testosterone value. And typically the symptoms that we see improvement are, are energy, sex drive, erectile function, muscle mass, fat deposition, some depression, and sleep. Those are the main symptoms that we see in patients. And typically, the lower the testosterone level you're starting at, typically those patients see the greatest improvement. 
Not all patients will see improvement in all of these variables, but many patients do. And what do you tell the doctor who says, well, just work on lifestyle issues first. If you start with lifestyle issues, then maybe if it's bad enough, we can address the testosterone issue. Kind of chicken or the egg. Where do you stand on that uh, topic? So I think lifestyle is extremely important. And I tell patients that it's not, not one or the other. We must do both at the same time. And what I expect from the patient are the four pillars, diet, exercise, sleep, and manage their stress, stress reduction. I don't have a pill on the planet stronger than diet, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction. Nothing. Even if they chose to do one of those and focus on one, it changes their entire life, right? So I tell them, you meet me halfway. You focus on diet, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction, and I will focus on optimizing you so that you can do the diet, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction. So together we're a team, but it really works best when both are optimized. Are there any patient populations that make you nervous or contraindications where you're like, nah, I really don't think this is a safe option for you? Well, I think that there's certain patient populations that need to be warned. For example, first of all, testosterone is a natural contraceptive. So if a person is trying to conceive or have a child, you absolutely do not want to give them testosterone because it will shut down the sperm count. So that's a, that's a guarantee. But based on the Traverse trial, I think we should just at least acknowledge the fact that there was a very slight increased risk in pulmonary embolism. So that should be mentioned on patients who have a history of pulmonary embolism. Uh, and I think it's also important to uh, let patients know that, you know, we still don't have a, a lot of data on patients who have had a history of prostate cancer, like radical prostatectomy, radiation. Um, so I just think that just proper counseling, I think most of us as clinicians feel comfortable giving testosterone men who have had a history of radical prostatectomy. But I think you just still want to have the appropriate counseling. In my area, I find a lot of primary care doctors are very fearful. Uh, they, they think testosterone is a very controversial issue, and they don't like to talk about it. Sometimes endocrinologists don't like to either. Why do you think it's so controversial as opposed to, say, thyroid hormone or insulin? I think most many uh, clinicians do not get much training on testosterone in medical school. I know I didn't. I did not get it actually until my late in my residency or my fellowship. So I think there's the uncomfort zone. I think that many of us were ingrained that testosterone causes prostate cancer. In 2000, when I started my fellowship, my residency, excuse me, we were told that it's, you know, if you have give it to a man who has a history of radical prostatectomy, it's like putting fuel on the fire. And so we were just ingrained that it has a lot of risk for prostate cancer. Um, and then the cardiovascular risk came up. So I think that, you know, there were many unknowns. And when there's unknowns, there's controversy. And I think a lot of that controversy has really been put to rest uh, with the Traverse trial. And do you think the type, you know, the Traverse trial was all on topical testosterone. Do you think the type of testosterone matters, whether it's injectable or some of these oral agents that are newer? Uh, how do you counsel your patients? So I think it could. And let's be honest. So remember that the concept of the, when it comes to prostate cancer and prostate safety, I'm not so concerned because I believe in the prostate saturation model. So understanding that patients who are below 250, roughly nanogram per deciliter of testosterone, as you raise them above the saturation, some adverse action can, can occur. You'll see a rise in BSA. You can see a transient worsening of BPH. But once you have patients above the, uh, uh, the saturation uh, tipping point, raising them to higher levels doesn't make a difference. So it doesn't matter if they're on a gel or an injectable. It's not going to make much of a difference. Cardiovascular, it could. Because the reality is that you have higher levels, which could induce erythrocytosis. Some studies have suggested that the injectable may have a higher rate of erythrocytosis and cardiovascular concerns in the gel. So it could. I'm not saying that it couldn't. But so I just think that it may not be as transferable when we're talking about cardiovascular risk. Can you give me a little bit of a history lesson? Um, why is testosterone a controlled substance? Why does it Why does it make me feel like an opioid prescribing doctor and, and that I need to give two-factor authentication and sign my life away every time I prescribe it? Yeah, because uh, there's a, uh, there's a, um, there's a potential for abuse, and it's actually now put in the baggage insert as a potential for abuse. And if there's any product that has a potential for abuse, addiction, uh, then it has to uh, be uh, more regulated. And do you think that the label change will happen now that the Traverse trial is out? Well, I think it should. So I think it's, it's only fair. The Traverse trial was initiated because of concerns that came out in 2010 to 2014. That's why the label changed. Uh, it was uh, FDA had required a uh, large clinical trial that was conducted. Uh, the large clinical trials show that there was no increased cardiovascular risk. So therefore, it makes sense to make that label change at this time. 
And finally, Dr. Kara, um, to paint a picture for us, people love stories. And you and I have so many stories of patients who just benefit so much from testosterone therapy, not your classic you know, bodybuilding patient who comes in wanting to abuse testosterone, but tell us a story of that guy that comes in and his life is transformed, his relationship, his um, everything is better, um, and, and what that relationship is like for you as a physician. So I agree with you, Rachel. There's, there is a profound effect in many men who initiate testosterone therapy on their quality of life, right? Their quality of life improves. And the typical man who's older, uh, remember that roughly 60% of patients who come in who have low T will have metabolic syndrome, diabetes, or um, uh, uh, obesity. So that syndrome is there. So you have the 60 or 58-year-old man with obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. He now has erectile dysfunction. He now has low libido. He has some depression, uh, increased fat deposition, decreased muscle mass. He's now having some difficulty with his relationship with his partner because he cannot engage in sexual activity. Um, and so he's stressed. And when you put these patients on testosterone, many of them could see a significant improvement in their energy. Fat deposition goes improves, muscle mass if they continue to work out. Uh, erectile function can improve, particularly if they're using a PD-5 inhibitor in combination therapy, libido. And if you watch them over time, uh, these patients are extremely appreciative when they come in, uh, thanking you for making a profound impact on their quality of life. And that's why you and I keep showing up to work all the time. So uh, this has just been an absolute honor. I am your number one fan and uh, we're very excited. Can you give us any, you probably aren't allowed to, are there any hints of what the next uh, stage of the Traverse trial or the things that it's going to show us? Has, has any abstracts been written or anything? No abstracts, but uh, next one's coming out next month, I believe. And um, and within the next six months, we'll have all three, the next three out. And then uh, hopefully... Uh, we can start taking a deeper dive at some sub-studies at the data set to look at other questions. I mean, it is a huge, amazing data set, and there's so many questions that we can answer uh, just by going through that data. Well, big congratulations, and we're all actively looking for the next data set to come out. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Rachel. Really enjoyed it.